Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Zoe. I'm a public programs facilitator here at ACME. Um, before we kick off, um, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional uh, custodians uh, of the land in which we gather tonight. Um, I'd like to pay my deepest respects to elders past, present and emerging, and also to those from other nations present here tonight. A big welcome to all of you here at Studio One for our conversations uh, segment. And we're also streaming on YouTube tonight. Um, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to the uh, season three of our conversations. Um, and tonight's panel, we're exploring uh, dystopia on screen. So our conversations here at ACME are a series of uh, talks covering uh, really fertile ground, um, such as the world around us, politics, society, culture, and how they intersect with the moving image. Uh, we're live streaming, as I said, uh, tonight's uh, talks, and there'll be a short Q&A at the end. So uh, we encourage you to ask some questions, but save them for the end. And uh, we'll be coming around with some microphones so that you can ask your questions to the panel. Uh, now, to kick off, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Lauren Rosewarn. She's our moderator and host for tonight's panel. A bit about Lauren. Lauren is a senior lecturer in the School of Social and Political Sciences at the University of Melbourne. In 2015, she was a visiting scholar at the University of Connecticut and in USA, and in 2011 was a visiting scholar at the University of Massachusetts. Lots of tricky American names there, Lauren. <laughs> she currently teaches in the areas of political science and gender studies and uh, writes, comments, and speaks on a wide variety of topics, including gender, sexuality, public policy, social media, pop culture, and technology. Lauren has authored nine books, as well as journal articles, book chapters, and hundreds of opinion pieces and popular culture columns. Uh, she's also been widely cited in uh, academic literature. So Lauren is currently a co-host on ABC Radio National's Stop Everything pop culture program and co-host of Mamma Mia's Sealed Section podcast. Over to you, Lauren. Thanks. You don't clap. <laughs> you don't clap. You don't clap before I've even spoken because now the bar's raised a little bit too high. So I'm going to introduce our speakers individually who will make short positioning statements and then we'll open it up. Um, questions I've got and questions that you've got. So Adolfo Aranwes, <laughs> I've been practicing all afternoon. I'm very is, proud of you. I know. Is editor of film and media peri uh, the film and media periodical Metro and editor in chief of Sexuality and Gender magazine Archer. He's also consulting editor of Liminal magazine, sub editor of Screen Education magazine, and a freelance writer, speaker, and dancer. Start us off. Um, <laughs> Given I'm first and I have a vehement opposition to super serious events and we'll be talking about serious things for the rest of this event. Ultra serious. Um, I thought I would just be a bit more cash and tell you three things. The first thing I was going to say is that this room is very memorable to me because the last time I was here was for the Melbourne Queer Film Festival when um, a short film that I choreographed and performed in um, was shown. It is a dance film about queerness and I was wearing mesh. And it showed my midriff and it was very interesting seeing my body blown up to a massive size with me giggling or hiding my face as the case may be. Um, one of the moves was like a, like a crotchy, pointy thing. Anyway, it's on iView if you'd like to watch it. It's called Dances. Um, the second thing I'm going to say is um, it's really interesting that I'm on another panel about dystopia because last year I spoke on a panel on dystopia for the Melbourne International Film Festival. And shortly after, I was asked to speak on a panel on dystopia at the Yarra Libraries. And then this year, I was asked to speak on this panel on dystopia. <laughs> and within a week, I was asked to speak on dystopia for, oh, uh, it's embargoed. Um, it's interstate, um, and I, I'm going to say that thing. I don't think I'm a particular expert in dystopia. I'm an expert in screen representation um, and a whole bunch of other things, but I like dystopian things, and I do my homework, so we'll have stuff to talk about. What was number three? Oh, number three is I have a cough. Um, it turns out it's not a viral thing. The GP told me yesterday that it's... He keeps reassuring me of that, although I feel my throat I've been, getting I've been, like, I've, been like I've been coughing in your presence a lot. And I'm feeling myself getting sick, but, but this is fine. Important. You broke my, like, rhythm. So, this is fine. Um, so the GP <laughs> assured me yesterday that it's not a cough. Apparently I've just been working too hard, as you probably gathered. My bio is usually longer, but anyway. Um, and so she told me that it's just um, asthma. And then she made me demonstrate 
me puffing in her presence, so I did. And then apparently I don't know how to use a puffer, so I need to buy a spacer, which children use. I haven't bought the spacer, um, and I puffed before, and I think I did it correctly, but if I cough, it is probably because I didn't buy the spacer, and I'm very sorry, but thank you for coming. So the time we allocated to you could have been used to talk about your background, but if you want to talk about medical calamities, no, I think I don't you can find, go to my website if you want to find out about me, or right. my Twitter. <laughs> Clementine Ford is a Melbourne-based writer, speaker and feminist thinker. She's a columnist for, the Fair, for Fairfax's Daily Life and is a regular contributor to The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. Take us away. Um, well, Adolfo, I also have a cough. And <laughs> is it a real cough? It's a real cough. Okay. Um, and I've got a really nice husky voice to go hey. along with it, which is the only upside to having a cough. Yeah. Um, I am a enthusiastic watcher of television and an, an enthusiastic watcher of dystopian narratives in particular. Um, not necessarily highbrow ones, but uh, and not just televisual ones either. I really like reading YA books. Um, and one of the things that I thought would be interesting to talk about today, like amongst each other, was the reason that the reason why dystopia is so is such an attractive literary tool and narrative for marginalized groups of people because it, of course it makes sense that um, it would be appealing to watch people who look like you fight against a system that is oppressing them um, and you're sort of allowed to do that if you, if you frame it in a dystopian way because no one's going to pop up and be like well not all men are like that. Um, so yeah so some of the shows that I really like and the ones that I'd, I'd be interested in talking about today are shows like The 100 um, which if Hands up anyone here who's watched The 100. Great, so almost none of you. Um, I counted at least four. <laughs> but it's, it's great because hopefully by the time you leave today, more of you will be inclined to go home and watch The 100. Um, <laughs> real cough. Hey. <coughs> I'll be doing that um, too. <laughs> the Handmaid's Tale, of course, I think we're going to talk about. Um, uh, those are the two that... I'm suddenly blanking on the rest of them, but I'm sure that there are others who will want to discuss things. Um, yeah, and I really want to kind of like look at the different ways that representation, I mean, similar to what you're, you're interested in, Adolfo, the, mm. ways, the ways that representation is really kind of given free range in, in narratives like dystopian fiction and dystopian television. Mm. Um, Oh, also the Black Mirror episode mm. of, you know, well, many of the Black Mirror episodes, but the one in particular that's kind of like in the background there um, is a perfect example of a dystopia that ends really well. Um, so, yeah, so that's me. Excellent, thank you. And lastly, Louise McKenzie, who uh, co-curated the Cinecity City project from 2009 to 2015, where participants made one-minute films exploring architectural ideas. Uh, she has a background in film and architecture and is presently studying for a PhD looking at the work of French filmmaker Jacques Tati. Oh. So, um, as Lauren said, I'm looking at uh, Jacques Tati's playtime and I'm arguing that the <coughs> sorry ultra hygienic modern city depicted oh sorry that in the ultra hygienic modern city depicted in the film nature has become abject and this is used to control the population so my interest in dystopian film and television lies in their often repeated themes of control power boundaries, the banishment of nature and the suppression of love, the last three being instruments of the first two. So in these uh, films, boundaries often appear, dividing people and nature, like the massive um, glass dome that covers the entire city in Logan's Run. And the boundary can also divide the powerful from the powerless, like the 20 metre high city wall in the French TV show Terrellium. So the rich live within the city wall and the jobless live outside of it. And I think that dystopian moving images have something to do with modernity. So in the dystopian film, the removal or suppression of nature can 
include that of the natural human body, which is often replaced with some form of technology. In the television show, Altered Carbon, the physical body becomes meaningless to the digitised selfhood, which exists in that world on a disc and is interchangeable with any other body. And uh, in A Brave New World, the 1980 version with Bud Court, which is a television movie, uh, we see bodies that no longer do natural things like giving birth. Here the babies are incubated in machines. So much has been written about this so-called rise in representations of dystopia. And I guess I'm wanting to start the discussion. Has there been a rise, or is this something we've actually always done through pop culture? And if there's been a rise, why? Louise, uh, uh, you're the expert. Uh, <laughs> I'm not an expert. I'm a nerd, just a nerd. <laughs> no, there's no expert. such thing as just a nerd. Yeah. Well, I... Th I think kind of yes and no. There hasn't been a rise because the, like in the 20s and 30s, novels like We and um, The Brave New World, I think, was mm -hmm. written in the 30s, which, yeah. and so, and then, like going through to the 70s, there's Logan's Run and Soylent Green, and T H X. 1128, which is kind of similar to we, where you take drugs to um, suppress um, so that you don't form relationships with other people, essentially. And people in the film, people stop taking those drugs and then develop relationships. So I think it's a continuation, but presently, at the moment, maybe if there is more dystopian images on screen. I think it might have something to do with um, our likelihood of becoming extinct because of, as a human race, because of the shocking way we've treated the planet. So I think that it's, um, which has been a concern for at least the 50s, but then even before that with the Industrial Revol Revolution. But I think that more and more, especially with our Australian government, who does absolutely nothing about, well, nothing, seem, seemingly nothing that will resolve the problem. Mm. So, yeah, I what, think that What do you think the difference is between science fiction and dystopia? I'm thinking in particular of, like, there's a book f that was written in 1950, I think, by John Christopher called The Death of Grass. And it's really a really great book. It's hard to believe, actually, that it was written in 1950 because it feels like it could have been published today. Um, and he's like a lot of his commentary in the beginning, it's, it's basically about a grass famine that sweeps the earth. And the first few chapters, he's, or the first few pages, really, he's kind of like exposing racism and um, anti-communist sentiment because the famine begins in China and the, the book's set in Britain and he has some of the characters and obviously as the, as the kind of like omnipotent narrator he's clearly not on the side of this viewpoint um, positioning themselves as like well of course that would never happen in Britain because we are more civilized than that so he's sort of really exposing this kind of racism and then of course very quickly the grass famine does reach Britain and they behave as humans do which is in panicked distress and turning to anarchy and violence um and i think that that book was classed as science fiction but it feels to me very much a vision of dystopian uh, in the past but really a vision of dystopian future as related to climate change so do you think that there's overlap or do you think that there's a distinct difference um I think that they do overlap because there's a, I can't remember what that film's called, but when it's made in the 70s and they're shot out into space. And so it's a sci-fi film, but the only thing, the it only... It space, or did it? Or uh, no. The, the only bit of Earth nature that's left is in the pod on the spaceship. Mm. 
Yeah, silent running. <coughs> yeah. So, yeah, I think there is a crossover there. And also mm. on spaceships, there's often no nature. Mm. And like in the spaceship on the Macallis, USS Callister in mm. the Black mm. Mirror. So, yeah, I think they do crossover. But, yeah, mm. what do you... I mean, like terminology aside, or like the difficulty quantifying whether it, it has been a rise or whether it stayed the same aside, um, I definitely would reckon that the the thing that has changed is is the form that, through which we access it. So I guess previously they were in novel form, um, whereas as media develops and cinema became like a dominant medium, and then television, and now Netflix, um, that the access you know with which people can can engage with these stories is so much like higher on the one hand, and then secondly also the way that we can immerse and engage with these texts. So I guess you see, you hear, you know, mm. you can feel, um, depending on if it's like a 40 cinema or something, um, you know, how, how these possible futures are real. Um, and the second thing um, also is when you were saying that it's interesting that this 1950s text feels very now. I mean, mm. isn't that kind of the, the thing about dystopias is that mm. they always posit a near future. Um, but weirdly, we also kind of never really get there. Um, yeah. So the funny thing about Blade Runner is that it was meant to be now, and we didn't get there. So they're like, <laughs> 2049 is the new thing. Um, I mean, same with 1984. Like it's kind of, it's kind of, it kind of happened, but like not at 1984. Um, so yeah, I think whether or not there has been a rise is maybe a separate question, um, or kind of like buried under the question of how has it morphed to remain relevant for so long. For me. Part of this definitional sort of aspect of wizard sci-fi is, is calling it speculative fiction and therefore getting away from the sci-fi which people often associate with aliens and whatnot and thinking of it as, as just this idea of sort of a near future or an imagined future. So the next question I want to ask is why in speculative fiction is there such a tendency to go down the dystopia route as opposed to imagining a utopia? Why do we always, when we're doing visions of the future, go dark? Do you think that Utopia would be very interesting to read about, though? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, I'm not trying to be funny or um, snarky, but I, I guess that's the thing is that, to me, when even when you say, like, why don't we write about a Utopia, I think, because to me that story would look like a place that pretends that it's a Utopia but actually has a really dark underbelly. But is that because we've been trained to wait for that? Like, oh, you know, he, he's, yeah, he's, he's going to be racist. We're going to find his racist Reddit remarks but in just, five minutes and tear him down. He's going to milkshake duck yeah. us. Um, no, I just feel like... Because a diet... I, I, there's no, there's no, what's the arc in a utopian mm. story? Everyone's happy. What does happiness look like? It doesn't... There's no conflict or tension mm -hmm. there. There's... Um, but isn't the tension kind of like when we have these imaginings of what does heaven look like? Your yeah. version and mine will be very different, right? This idea of a utopia. Is that not the tension? The fact that how do we actually agree on what looks like good to all of us? Well, that would be an interesting and that's film, what, I think. Yeah. Well, we'll write it after this. We'll yeah, <laughs> people getting to decide their utopia in, in heaven. But there would still be... I don't know. But surely there'd be conflict because someone who yeah. had a vision yeah. of a white, uh, all white supremacist type vision is going to clash dramatically with someone's, anyway. Well, would they get into heaven though? Let's hope not. <laughs> Forget heaven. I just was um, using it as no, a kind no, no, no. of um, fantasy. I, I suppose the thing is, well, for me personally, I can only speak to me as to why I enjoy these kinds of narratives. And that's because um, I'm very basic. Um, <laughs> no. But I like, I like a, a first, a second and a third act. Mm. I like feeling like, even though you know at the end of the story that everyone's going to be okay, I like going, oh, my God, are they going to be okay? Is Maverick going to make it? Not that that's dystopia, but um, I, I think that... And, again, like going back to that idea of representation, it's, uh, it's interesting to me to watch stories like this because they, they so often feature protagonists that are traditionally left out of hero tales in you know in advent adventure films or in action yeah. films mm -hmm. so for me to be able to watch is it as basic as the fact that I like watching people who aren't white men on screen maybe it's as basic as that but it's also because I think um I can I can relate as I said to that sort of mi micro sense of what this is representing which is someone who feels like they have no control 
in the world that they're in, that everyone else is controlling and dictating their life for them, being somehow able to figure out their way to agency and become not just a part of dismantling the system of oppression that they live in, but actually maybe the hero of the tale. Um, and I think just narratively that's what's exciting mm. about watching it. You know, Then you think about long-running series like The Handmaid's Tale where we are so not anywhere near the point of um, success or... <coughs> Sorry, I was trying not to cough. <coughs> where it starts to feel like how long can you watch something that's so torturous and Which so is part of the painful. accusations of this being a p torture porn series uh, yeah. in, se in the second season based on how much more agony do I need to go through as a viewer to get to resolution. Yeah. Um, and I think that there has to be, when you're dealing with dystopian texts, I feel like there has to be a distinct beginning, middle mm -hmm. and an end. And again, you know, looking at The Handmaid's Tale, the way that... American television in particular is set up is that they, you know, British TV is, is particular in the way that, like, they'll say, well, we're going to do three series and that's the story and and that's that's how the arc works and then the, then the story is finished. Yeah. Um, whereas American television is like, how long can we churn this out for? How many series can we have of this? So I don't know how true this is, but I've, I remember reading recently that The Handmaid's Tale is trying to plot at least ten series. Oh. I think, well, well at, like, at where can the story possibly go? But that's very common. Like The Good Wife is an example. After yeah. they had one successful season, they wanted a seven series arc and that's that what they committed yeah. to. So all the episodes were written around this idea of having a seven season vision. But that's difficult when you're... That's fine if you're dealing with a legal drama. But if you're dealing with something that's... Has an you know, about the, like, a, a, few, a speculative mm. version of the world where people are being horrifically oppressed, tortured, maimed and assaulted, like there's only so many times you can kind of like recycle yeah, the state of, that they're living in and, and grant the power back to the oppressors before yeah. you, you can no longer be invested in that narrative. Yeah, right. I so I feel like that's the episode. tricky balance. Sorry. Sorry. I went from episode two to ten because I thought I couldn't in season one and mm. then I, yeah, because I couldn't watch the whole. So you watched it to the end? And skip the middle? Is that what you mean? Yeah, I did. Because I thought... <laughs> <laughs> what's Live your life. <coughs> it's just going to be on and on and on. Yeah, I just wanted to see her escape. Which well, you're going to have to wait a long time season that. three. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Mm. But mind you, then there's... Like, it can be done well. So, um, going back again to the series The 100, which the basic premise of which is... It started off as a YA fiction series um but it's it sort of very quickly departed from the narrative i haven't read the book so i can't say how much it diverted from it but basically the premise is that uh 100 years into the future 97 years into the future earth has destroyed itself um or sorry 97 years after earth has been destroyed through a nuclear holocaust um and people like a, an arc of humans escaped the earth at that time and went to <laughs> just bear with me, went to live in space um, in like satellite arcs and then um, they're running out of oxygen. So this is all in the first sort of couple of episodes. They're running out of oxygen and if you do anything to violate the code on the arc, then you'll immediately be um, floated into space. Uh, but if you're under 18, of course, they can't kill you. So they just imprison you. And so they're running out of oxygen and they're like, well, the adults are like, well, we think that maybe the Earth is inhabitable now. So what we'll do is we'll send a hundred of these kids under 18 to the, the earth of our prisoners uh -huh. to see whether or not the air is breathable. So it's an initially very dodgy premise, but one that is, <laughs> one that of course, if you're, as a teenager, I would have been like, this is the greatest story that I've ever <laughs> read in my life. Um, because teenagers love dystopian fiction because they feel like they have no control over their lives. And so this is a way for them to navigate gaining control back. Anyway, so they land on the ground, um, they sort of set up camp, they can breathe because the radiation that they've experienced their whole life in space means that they can tolerate the levels of radiation on the earth, science. Um, <laughs> but then they quickly, so they establish a camp and they have to like deal with each other, but then very quickly they realise that they're not alone on earth, that there are Ooh. people, like humans who have survived, who they quickly call the grounders. And here's where it gets interesting, is that it doesn't then just become this story about 
colonizers from space <laughs> coming and stealing the earth back and like fighting against the aggressive people who've been left behind it actually becomes a really interesting narrative about how colonization works and so you you learn to like you learn about the grounders and you and you realize you kind of in introduced to their struggle against these people that have come to take their land essentially and there's it's a show that has like a significant number of people of color who are performing in it, mm. a significant number of women, women in leadership roles who there's never any kind of, this is the other thing I think that's great about dystopia is that you can create structures where you don't have to deal with all of our bullshit that we kind of fixate on now, it's not realistic or whatever. You can have women in leadership roles and no one's gonna be like, well, it's not, no one in the premise of the show is gonna be like, well, that's not very realistic that you're the president of the colony um, because it's just accepted that women lead the grounder tribes and are like the warrior queens, etc., and that women can lead in the, the sky people, whatever. So I think that that stuff is, is interesting too, how you can, how those groups of people who've, who are never represented can, can create narratives in which they don't have to wade through all of that proving their right to kind of like be in these roles. They can just get straight to the story. I mean, the thing with yeah. these... I mean, you mentioned the word text before, and it is true that they are texts um, on the one hand, and then on the other hand, they're also cultural products or commercial products, really. Um, and I think that's probably what lends itself to having these quite mm -hmm. specific things that reoccur. Um, and I mean, there is a formula, I think, in the, in, with the dystopian text. You know, you have one element of today's society, you magnify it or you distort it. Um, you have a hero. Um, and that's where this, the conflict comes in, so that's why you can't have a utopia, because nothing happens. Like, speaking on a traditional, like, fiction level, which is stuff that we've been taught, because you were saying before. <coughs> this is stuff we learn as children. We read fairy tales and stuff. We get used to beginnings, middle, and ends. We get used to um, the introduction of something foreign, or that's, you know, the conflict, yeah. and then it has to be resolved. Um, so, I was thinking when you said utopia, of the happy place, which is set in heaven, it's not a. Uh, that was what I was. That's when I used the word heaven. I was actually thinking of that show, and then well, the name Well, as you discover, me. because spoiler, so we can't say it, but yeah. yeah. So I mean, <laughs> <laughs> this is very hard to discuss. Um, and that's a sitcom, which is it wouldn't. Mm. It's not dystopian, as, or it, it's speculative fiction through a sitcom. Right. Has mm. anyone seen The Good Place? It's so good. I hate it's really, it. really good. What? I hate another it. panel for another. Time. Yeah, it's a, it's a conversation. Anyway, I have for a point. Time. I wasn't finished. No, I, I, what I was going to say about the, <laughs> the good place was just like it was just a separate thing. Um, um, you mentioned heroes, um, which do occur a lot in dystopian mm. um, texts, and I have this theory that part of that taps into the prevalence of Judeo-Christianity in, in Western societies, because I was talking to someone about this recently. I don't know if dystopian texts have the same kind of impact in societies that don't have this same cultural standpoint. So we are obsessed with breaking down an existing oppressive system and having like a person save us. Whether or not you're Christian or not, it doesn't matter. It's kind of instilled, it's built into Eurocentric mm -hmm. society. Um, and there's research and so on that about the appeal, yeah. appeal of Marvel comics and stuff right. like, where people have, even if we're abandoning Jesus and concepts of, of that, we still want to direct that compulsion to be saved mm -hmm. to someone else. And then obviously teenagers want to be that person, mm. which is a subset. Mm. Yeah. So part of me thinks that there's something, and Louise kind of touched upon this now, that there's something happening culturally right now that makes it for a particularly fervent ground for, for these dystopian narratives. I'm thinking, and I... We're 590 days into what I would classify as a dystopia, if you're on that side of politics. <laughs> With that in mind, 590 days, why would we elect now to use our leisure time to watch something that is even a more exaggerated version of a world we're living in now? Why? Why do we do it? To, is it a masochistic complex or is there something else? I think it's exploring what's going on where we where we are because I don't know history's hurt I mean stories have and still are used to uh, convey knowledge and explain things to each other so I think for me anyway that's why I watch them and uh, like in the episode of USS McAllister I was sitting because I'm not very IT Savvy, the black um, mirror one. I was like, is this possible? Can they, how did they, <laughs> oh my God. But it, 
So I think, like, because the, well, we don't know what's going to happen with the IT stuff, maybe how, although that's not dystopian, it's um, sci-fi, maybe how, maybe computers will be able to jettison this out to space and they can take control eventually, we don't know. Because it seems to me a lot of, um, well, with USS McAllister and Altered Carbon, they're doing that digital body yeah. sort of integration mm -hmm. thing and the body becomes unimportant. There's kind of a conservative thread in that, isn't there, that um, particularly in like, I love Black Mirror, but Charlie Booker's whole thing is just like, technology bad, yeah. will destroy us. And it sort of seems to be like, oh, like if we return to simpler times, then it's, it's the complications of modern life that lead to dystopian ways of being or, you know, the, it's the aspirations for power that lead to it. But if we just returned to a simpler time, then we'd live in a utopia, um, which I just, I think is, I don't know, I think you can look at like the risks of technology, but at the root of that, it's, it's still how humans will use it mm. to kind of like p propel themselves forward into positions of power or to have power over other people. Um, but maybe like the, the kind of overarching fear there is that like comes back again to that lack of control is that, you know, in, in narratives like this, that it's the robots will take over and then we lose control completely and we become dehumanised by an outside force. Um, yeah, I'm just sorry, just stream of consci consciousness -ing there. But um, yeah, like I feel like the... The way one of, one of the reasons why I enjoy watching those things now, even though we are arguably living in a diminished nightmare of the similar proportions, <laughs> um, is I guess like yeah, like you said, like it's about storytelling. It's about it's about it's about finding solidarity with other people, you know. And, and I suppose as well in in an, in an almost egotistical way, it's about being reassured that because you know that the narrative is on your side. You know, you're not watching a dystopian depiction of a world. I mean, it's not a propaganda film yet. Mm. So that's the difference. Yeah, it's yeah. like feeling like oh, I can watch this because this is actually as hopeless as this world is that I'm looking at. It's actually giving me hope to know that there are people out there who are still opposed to what's happening in this story, who, who still mm -hmm. feel like all of this stuff is very fucked up. And the moment maybe where it switches to we, can, we only have propaganda films to watch is when we may be less excited about watching them. I mean, film is a tool for catharsis, right? Like we watch films because we have feelings and we feel that we identify with those feelings in other people. Um, we feel there's like a therapeutic element when we watch something. Mm -hmm. um, there's a pleasure that we get from, from engaging with a visual text that we don't get in any other kind of experience. I mean, it transcends, you know, media in this form, like you could go to a gallery and look at a piece of art and kind of find yourself lost in that. Um, so I think that's part of why potentially we do that. There's a sense of, on the one hand, yeah, you, you feel like you, someone's commiserating with you. But on the other hand, also there's that distance of knowing that it's self-contained and it's mm. not happening to you. There's something worse off than you, um, even if it's just a possibility. It's something that's not quite happening to you just yet. Um, can I backtrack to the technology? No, go on. Please, thank you. Um, I have a bone to pick with, with this perspective that technology is the root of evil. Oh, I didn't, um, yeah. I didn't no, say I that. Know, I know it's not yeah. no, no, with Charlie Booker. Yeah. Yeah. You're great. Um, Charlie, though. You're great. Charlie, Charlie though. We're, we're, just like, yeah. we're just like mm, white men. Um, that, yeah, this, I mean, there was a time, I mean, every, a tool, a tool is technology. Language is a technology. Um, and humans have always incorporated elements from our environment to alter the way our brain, brains work. Mm. There was a time, this isn't very, you know this Brody, so shush, but people don't know this necessarily. But during Plato's time, writing was demonized because it was believed that it would stop the brain from um, being able to retain information. It was a primarily oral time, 
in human history. Um, and so the introduction of, of writing was perceived as a threat to the brain's ability to work. I actually did an essay on this when I was at uni because I was so obsessed with this and I was a Wunderkind. Um, and there were psychological studies done about how the brain, instead of diminishing function, what happens is the brain builds into its apparatuses the, the, the external technologies that we use. So, and then it frees up certain parts. It's kind of like when you get an external hard drive, basically. Um, and it frees up certain parts of your brain to then elaborate, which, according to these studies, it's what allowed us to understand deep thought, the complex thought, you know, in, in, in explore ideas in, in much more rich ways because we weren't forced to just retain them with the limits of speech. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and, no, I think maybe that is the only thing I was going to say. Yeah, we've always been cyborgs, and that's totally not itself a bad thing. What is a bad thing is how we then use that cyborg status um, to amplify the negative aspects of, of society running or, you know, hurting each other. Mm. I'm done. Mm. The, the um, thing that interests me with the technology and the body and modernity is that at the turn of the 20th century, maybe before the... Um, well, up until if that's the end point where we're totally digitised, the body has uh, been, you know, it's kind of yucky and machines are clean and wonderful mm. and the body's dirty and, you know... Unpredictable. Unpredictable. Mm. Yeah, our behaviour's unpredictable and it exudes stuff and messes up stuff like modern architecture and or that set from the film was that the same image different image that come on and so i think that and somehow it's used to it's another mechanism of control like in terrellium the rich people within the city wall are all clean and mm. there's no and plants or animals, so nature's kind of expelled and outside everyone's dirty and grubby <coughs> and they can't bathe because there's no water, hardly any water to drink. And so, yeah, there's something... It's interesting because the, the just... I don't know if this is just a characteristic of all dystopia, but I imagine it's fairly common and it's certainly in the narratives that I like to watch, is that exploration of class, mm. dif yeah. disenfranchisement and particular classes of people yeah. wielding power over yeah, the grubby and the, you know, the ones left outside the walls, mm. whichever. There's always a wall. Always yeah. a Build a wall. Yeah. Um, <coughs> yeah, and... Yeah. I think I forgot what I was going to say. Yeah. There's a there's a good... It wasn't actually made into a TV series or a film because, unfortunately for the author, I think it happened just a little bit before the real explosion of, you know, like the Hunger Games and so on. Um, but it's a Scott Westerfeld series called Uglies, Pretties, Specials. Um, it's three different books, Uglies, Pretties and Specials. And Scott West Westerfeld is a YA author. And it's, it's again, a dystopian kind of narrative about... Um, a world in which... But it sort of subverts what you're saying about the, the nature side of things because the reason that they kind of... Basically, everyone starts off uh, normal and, of, and, of course, when they turn, like, 16, then they undergo this series of procedures that make them really, really pretty. So it's, it sort of appeals to, like, teenage ideals as well. But the process of this is that the, the female protagonist learns that this prettifying of people is also like dumbing down their mm -hmm. brains to keep them really compliant yeah. within this world that's been created. And there's, again, yeah. a, a border around the world. Uh, yeah. And within the world, the nature is very organised and it does exist, but it's not... Yeah. It's very, like, you know... Controlled. controlled. Mm -hmm. But they find out at the end of the series that, um, yes, this, this control of the population has been happening and it's not defended as such and it's not... It's almost like... It was the price that had to be paid because humanity was destroying the earth. Oh, and so they needed to control the population mm. by, and make them subservient in order to actually defend and protect 
the environment. Uh, yeah. So um, that's the way I remember reading it anyway. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I think that that's interesting what you're saying about the, the way that environmental things play in as well too. Yeah, I think... The, yeah, that I remember before. I think, well, for me, the ones that I like, there's definitely an almost unseen hand that has total control mm -hmm. and you have to mm -hmm. obey. Otherwise, you jettison beyond the boundary. And, yeah, in Logan's run, that's envir uh, environmental, I think, because the planet's been destroyed and in 23-something mm -hmm. or other, when <coughs> instead of dying at... <coughs> 30 or whatever it is, Logan and his girlfriend, whose name I can't remember, and I should, but anyway, they escape and go back into nature. But I think with, yeah, with, within the boundaries in that one, mm. they're, like, they don't, I don't think they have babies anymore. They have, um, they can have sex, but they don't have love and relationships. Mm. And I don't know what my point is, but there's something, yeah, I guess there's two things. There's what we're doing to nature, that one you're talking about sounds really interesting. And also the nature within our own bodies that seems to in lots of modern tales seems to be denied, mm. like the mechanical Maria mm. in Metropolis. Mm. And, yeah. So there's been a criticism of dystopian narratives recently. I'm going to read out a, a quote from Brady Gerber, who base I'm giving you the summary, basically that these narratives are lazy and that they're the laziest kind of politics we can have in 2018. So his quote, and this comes from a, a Literary Hub article, in a nation full of political hobbyists, championing dystopian art has become a go-to for those who want to take a political stand without actually doing anything. If we accept that we're already uh, living in a dystopia, then it's too late. Life imitates art. I'm interested in your thoughts on this concept of dystopia being a way, kind of like clicktivism, a way to, for people to feel politically active because I'm watching a show showing how bad it is and that that's then the full extent of our politicking. Sure. Um, I think, I mean, I, when I first read that article, I was like, yeah, that's so true. People are stupid. Um, <laughs> but, I mean... Uh, on reflection, um, I think that's actually, it does a, dis a disservice to like humans' ability, like uh, our literacy, our media literacy. We can distinguish between types of texts. We can distinguish between types of action. I mean, I know that when you watch a show like Black Mirror, you don't necessarily stop using your phone. Um, in fact, you probably use your phone to look up something that happened in the show to double check. Or just because you or have to scroll it. on Facebook oh, yeah, while yeah. you're watching or it. Or right? watching it on your phone. Or oh, watching it on your phone. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it's a bit, it's a bit of a naive um, kind of misunderstanding of intention and, and, and audience. Like, the point of these texts isn't necessarily to cause you to do something. It's primarily, well, as I said, text and, and products. It's to sell a story and get audiences to entertain you. Um, and if you take away something from that, which is inevitable because all, you know, humans take things from texts all the time, um, then that's a positive thing. Um, but yeah, I feel, I feel that's, that's a bit unfair for this writer to make that call and say that it's... Because, it, I, I mean, this is an ongoing like, debate in, in, sorry, in um, media theory or critical theory. It's gone on since um, the 1930s, mm -hmm. the Frankfurt School, the, the idea that popular culture is just a narcotic. Mm. Um, and yeah, we do switch off sometimes when we do that, but there is a choice to do that. There is an active choice to switch off in that moment. Um, and even in those moments of apparent, you know, opiatic joy, you will occasionally find yourself thinking about something because something sparks your curiosity um, mm. or makes you want to look up a way to avoid someone using your DNA for, <laughs> that's what this is about. I just think it's real intellectual snobbery. Mm. You know, just, to sort of, I don't know, I just imagine him like sitting in his room writing his Damn his room. article <laughs> on, his, on his desk. On and his analogue phone? Yes, that's a really good point. Hmm. <laughs> like, it just offends me. And it's not just, it, it's not just, it's, it offends me not 
just because he said it there, but because it's an argument that people consistently yeah. use to discredit thinking humans mm -hmm. who are capable yeah. of caring about more than one thing mm -hmm. at one time, you know. Yeah. To say, it just seems to me so ignorant to sit there and say, or like assert that somehow, well, people will watch dystopian things because then they can pretend that they're political. You know, like, no, probably a lot of extremely politically active people, far more politically active than Randy, what's his face? <laughs> Brady Gerber. Whatever his name is, who cares? Probably watch, mm. you know, they also like to go home at the mm. end of the day and switch off in front of the TV. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing as well is that some people watch these shows who aren't politically active and maybe wouldn't even consider themselves going forward politically active, but they go and they speak to their friends about the issues that have been brought up mm -hmm. by some yeah. of these shows. They have conversations that spark thinking in them and then they might start noticing stuff that's going. I just think that it's like, like all kind of elite group. And, and I really hate that he's made me talk about elite intellectuals because that plays into their hands. <laughs> but all of those people that act somehow as if like the masses are just sitting there kind of like feeding on the drug of pop culture and they're not in any way, shape or form capable of like mm. consuming it critically. Um, or because something's popular, then it must be mindless or yeah, it must yeah. be... I mean, that's just such a basic argument. It's like a teenage yeah. argument. Mm. Oh, <coughs> I would have gone to it, but too many people like that band. Yeah. Yeah. You know? The Makes me mad, mad, mad. <laughs> <laughs> the old stuff's better than the new stuff. Yeah. <laughs> The, uh, I think that the works themselves, the films themselves, are acts of, are political acts, in, you know, depending. Because, mm. like you say, we watch them and engage with them, mm. and we're not just being swamped by them, we are thinking mm. whoever we are, you know. Yeah, and the idea and that something's like... Talk about it only smart if it's inaccessible to the majority yeah. of the population yeah. is totally self-defeating. Yeah. So to defend him, just for a moment, to play devil's advocate, Ew. and I guess why it, the quote appeals to me, I don't think he actually went out at this line of sort of pop culture mm. being dumb, so much as that writes people a get out of jail free card mm. from doing anything about contemporary politics. I'll give you an example. So when the American presidential election result happened, I'd been watching a year of intense as a political junkie, CNN, oh, you know, a lot of content. Then this election result happens, and I feel, as a political scientist, completely, how did this happen? How was I not prepared? And emotionally, I was a mess for three days. I didn't understand how he got this. I felt, I think I kind of had given myself too much credit and too much credit to the people around me that being aware of these issues, seeing Trump for who he was, was enough. And I guess that's why that quote appealed to me <laughs> in this sense of, I think, <coughs> by watching dystopian shows, by watching John Oliver, by watching CNN, we've kind of lulled ourselves into thinking that we're savvy and that we're, we'll be okay because we're assuming that other people are watching this material the same as us. But we're not okay. We're 500 and whatever days into not being okay. And I, I guess I read that quote as kind of, has pop culture and the savviness and perhaps the sort of liberalism of pop culture given us an excuse not to be more angry but also more active? See, I prefer your article. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I, maybe I'm giving him too much credit, but I really, because I've tried to work through how did I not prepare, how was I not prepared for this election result? How have we gone through 590 days with this new normal? And part of me genuinely believed, and I was so angry at all the news I'd watched for a year because I felt that they'd prepared me for a result that we weren't going to get. And I'm wondering, that's the kind of numbing effect mm -hmm. I wonder pop culture has. Not that pop culture is crap or that it's not valuable, but that actually it's lulled us into thinking. But I don't know that that's the fault of, um, I am not a political scientist like you, so just to lay it's person a special here. power there. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I don't know that that's the fault of watching, I, I don't think that that was, it didn't seem conceivable to anyone that that could be the result because it's completely insane. Yeah. Um, and maybe instead of, again, not trying to be 
like, genuinely not trying to make a joke, but maybe instead of watching, you know, dystopia or CNN or what, what, all these things that are supposed to have, like, lied to us, maybe we should have been watching, what is it, the Duck, Duck Brothers? You know, that, like, it's, on, it's like a... Oh, the hillbill... I mean, the people from the... The Duck, the duck Dynasty, Duck yeah. Dynasty, that's the... Yeah. Or because Fox. we kept, you know, and I don't like the argument that, like, oh, well, you know, the reason that Trump was elected because was because people didn't pay attention to the white working class in America. Like, mm. no, Trump was elected because people are racist fuckheads um, <laughs> and misogynists, and they love seeing a man in power who just does whatever he wants because it means they can do whatever they want. Mm. And that is my political take. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, but like, I I don't think that it's. So the reason I don't, I, I, I understand what, where your argument is coming from, and it, and it makes and sense. And it's only to me. an interpretation. It's not. It makes sense to me when you when you phrase it the way that you yeah. do. The reason I think that it annoys me, hearing it from what's his name, <laughs> Brandy. I feel terrible <laughs> for him. He's not here to defend himself. Bra Brady Gerber. Brady Gerber. The reason that it annoys me coming from Brady Gerber is because I am going to assume, and maybe I'm incorrect, but I'm going to assume that Brady Gerber is a white man. And didn't Google his picture, but... I could be wrong on that, but I'm going to assume it. And I feel angry when white men in particular um, decide to, like, l you know, share their opinions on how these things that people who experience marginalisation that they have no idea of, they share their opinions on how the things that those people like are either not good enough or they're representing the world in an incorrect way or they're leading us all into a false consciousness or whatever. It's, it just annoys me because the reason that people watch dystopian fiction, as we've been talking about, is not just because they're trying to be politically engaged with what's going on in their current environment, but it's also because they're represented often in it. So I feel like it, it, his argument kind of just discounts and discredits a whole... Um, aspect and element of what it is that would be appealing to people about living in a political climate like this and watching shows in which they are represented as the dismantlers of those societies. I mean, a key thing also is that you were watching the news rather than dystopian texts, right? Oh, for me and it was a combination, <coughs> but yes. Yeah. I mean, I didn't like mean that to sound snarky. Um, I just mean that, you know, it is, there is a sense that when, we bring a lot of baggage when we engage with text, you know, there's genre, there's, there's form, um, there's like expected truth content, and when you watch the news, you assume that this can build up into some kind of revelation about the world that we live in, on the one hand. And then when you enter into like a kind of contract with a fictive text, you're aware that there will be licenses taken, that there will probably be a resolution, even if it takes 10 seasons to get there, um, that everything is neater and more predictable. Even if there are twists taken, it is predictable. So perhaps maybe that's part of the unfairness of like the false equivalence that's being brought up here is that <coughs> these texts weren't ever meant to tell you how it'll pan out it tells you how it will pan out in this specific version of the world, which doesn't necessarily match our world, um, perhaps. But no, 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 I mean, and you also raise points, and this is part of that sort of question about representation and mm. when you see minorities or people who have been historically marginalised represented, we suddenly want them to do due justice mm. to every single marginalised person who's never been represented before. So that person mm. has the weight on their shoulder of being everything to every marginalised person. I mean, they're still characters. That's right. And made up by someone else. Yeah, and also mm. some fiction writer had written this character to be flawed, yeah. not a political agent of you know, or a representation. Mm. So an extension of this idea of criticisms, of, of popular criticisms of dystopian fiction, I'm quoting the New York <coughs> Times, who argued that we get the dystopian TV that we deserve. What are your thoughts there? Louise. <laughs> <laughs> I did, sorry, I wrote that. What did we, sorry, we get, oh yeah. I thought um, that it didn't make sense because um, his statement didn't make sense because uh, yeah, to some extent people watch the shows to enjoy it so it's not a punishment. Well, deserve is loaded, isn't it? Mm. It's, it, it's yeah. as though we're saying you're, you're, you're getting something that's bad. And therefore that reflects. Yeah. And there's a generational critique, you could argue, that's inherent in that. Yeah, I mean, when I heard it, I, I did associate that, you know, you get the governments that you deserve. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I, I guess I, I'm sort of with Louise, but I don't really understand what the statement is trying to say. Um, I think sometimes, and maybe this is unfair, and maybe it doesn't apply to this particular sta article this statement came from, but I think sometimes the um, the way that the news cycle and the opinion cycle works in a world where we have easy access to infinite number of opinions at any time, but also if you work within the opinion factory, you have to kind of like keep churning out opinions in order to pay your bills. Yeah. I think sometimes the way that people respond to stuff they're, you know, it's that, that thing of like looking for a hot take mm. on something, and just because you find a hot take doesn't mean that the hot it's take a good has take? doesn't mean it's a good one. It doesn't mean it has substance. Um, it, again, like not to sort of like uh, simplify it too much, but oh, people, lots of people like and enjoy dystopia. So let me come up with a reason why that might mm. not be the best thing, you know, or let me come up with a reason why the t the TV that they're enjoying. The actual pleasure that they're taking in watching, going home at the end of the day and watching a TV show, why it's not really that good when it comes to artistic Yeah, and there's an industry today. of this type of think piece. Yeah, so, and so when I yeah. hear that, I'm just like, oh, that just sounds like a bad take to me, you know? I mean, an interesting aspect of, for me, the argument that w argument? The take, maybe mm. like underformed take that was presented is that this author posits a distinction between dystopia and cacotopia. Um, so both terms mean like a bad place, topos place, yeah. Um, but he, he, is it a he? Mm. He was saying um, that some theorists distinguish between dystopia and cacotopia. Dystopia being a place where there's political oppression, cacotopia where there's moral decline. And I think mm. this person was kind of saying that people who like The Handmaid's Tale are into cacotopia because we deserve it, because we are in a cacotopia. Yeah. And I find that a little bit, I mean, society is always falling apart. Um, mm. No matter what century or millennium you look at, and there is always- And every century has critiqued that the next generation will is gonna ruin everything. destroy everything, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think Jermaine Greer, uh, <laughs> hugely problematic <laughs> We were always gonna go there eventually. <laughs> yeah, like Jermaine Greer's take on The Handmaid's Tale was that women enjoy watching it. Women are really into watching it because they enjoy watching themselves be tortured on screen. It's like, that is also a bad take. <laughs> um, but mm. yeah, similar to like, that's mm. the sort of essentially the same kind of argument that, you know, it's cacotopia being like reflected. We're inevitably going to screen. destroy ourselves. Yeah. yeah. And, ag and again, it's like an intellectually superior argument because I am assuming she doesn't include herself in that mm. group, you know, so she, she makes yeah. better choices. <laughs> and better judgments about the kind of... But then that's the people who watch soap operas and say, but I'm watching it reading it against the grain, as opposed to all of you who are watching it like yeah. cultural zombies, I'm reading it critically. But that's, that's what I mean, like, when, you know, in judging or in sort of, like, taking with a grain of salt the people who make arguments against things that find popularity yeah. amongst yeah. the masses, just because something is popular doesn't mean that it's not good, Bad, you know? Yeah. yeah. So Delphi, you used the word takeaway a little bit earlier, and I guess we've also sort of, the, what our takeaways are from watching this material. We've also talked about, you know, escapism, catharsis, etc. Is there an educative function here? Is there something we can learn from watching these shows? And I, I understand that that's not the goal, it's a goal, it's a commercial product, etc. But is there something for audiences to take away and do something with? Um. I think, I mean, this is a very individual question, isn't it? Because as I say, we, we bring baggage when we watch texts. We all come from different backgrounds. We engage with texts for different reasons. Like there is an intentionality when you engage with the text. And you may not necessarily learn anything um, if you don't choose to. Like you could switch off from, you know, a message being delivered to you very clearly. Um, but I mean, I do think an interesting thing, I was, I've been trying to like shoehorn it into this whole discussion, but I was also being respectful, um, was that a really fascinating thing for me about dystopias is, um, Louise, you mentioned the invisible hand before, like controlling yeah. the, the city or the society. Um, and that is something that's integral to capitalistic societies, this idea that there is an invisible hand that will you know, make us all um, find success or make money or whatever, um, the capitalist trickle-down idea, free markets, et cetera. Um, and that all rests on the idea of equality of opportunity. But dystopias are kind of like 
a refracted version of a communist society where it's not about everyone coming at it from the same standpoint, but arriving at a place where ostensibly everyone will equally be better off, but it just goes wrong. Um, so I think for me, the biggest takeaway possibly on a macro level is that dystopias allow us to envision a place where capitalism is kind of fucked. Um, communism may not necessarily be the answer either, um, but we need to figure out a way so that this illusion of equality of opportunity is necessarily our starting point or like the ultimate goal and focus on equality of outcome as the ultimate goal. How we achieve that again is, is a bit tricky um, and as dystopias show us, there's always some party that inevitably abuses that intention um, and becomes fascistic and excludes people or makes them feel inferior or eats them, whatever. <laughs> the, the Time Machine um, by H.G. Wells. Um, Mm, no, that's and so, yes. Toilet green. Um, <laughs> totally. So um, yeah, that's that's my kind of take on takeaways. Mm. Mm. Well, I I was just listening in rapture. Right. So, I think, oh no. Oh no. I was just thinking as you were talking about capitalism and the you know, there are elements that elements of things that are happening in. Uh, the world today and in Australia that uh, would definitely not be out of place mm. in a dystopian novel. So do you think we're living in a dystopia? Or bo uh, it's just to everyone. You go. Um, well, I don't know if we're living in a dystopia because for me the dystopian, I mean, elements maybe because there was a documentary called Detroit-topia about kind of the death of the mm. heart of Detroit and actually much of its, not just its heart, much of it. So I guess maybe they felt dystopian, the people living there, because the city was kind of abandoned. Uh, the mm. population decreased and buildings were abandoned and there wasn't any jobs. But for me, the dystopian thing is always a bit in the future or way in the future. So it's an exploration and maybe it's exploring where we are now. But yeah, so I think elements of where we are could be dystopian, but it's not a total dystopia. But then is the, is the differentiation there the difference right? is the difference there <laughs> that we like if it's always in a little bit in the future and we never reach it then dystopia can never actually exist in our physical world it can only ever exist narratively because there's there's things you know about you know one of the one of the interesting critiques of the handmaid's tale is this uh, and celeste little here wrote a, you know a great piece about it that white women, of which of course I'm one, tend to watch the show and they're like, oh my God, it's just so terrifying. And the t really terrifying thing is just thinking it could, it could happen, like it could so easily which happen. Which is the appeal of, of dystopia. It feels close, just not quite close. Not quite. But of course, like as Celeste right. and many other writers pointed out, this has happened to yeah. Aboriginal yeah. women in this country, yeah. happened to black women in America, um, like strong elements of that. And... So, and that's, of course, like in the not-so-distant past and, and the legacy of that continuing today. You know, the White Australia policy is straight out of, like, a dystopian mm -hmm. text. So have we lived in a dystopia? I mean, if it's, if it's always going... If it always has to be, like, slightly further in the future, is there a difference between what a dystopia, the way that we frame it in our fiction, the way that we allow that that fictional thing to become reality, even even in terms of our understanding of history and stuff. Like yeah. Aboriginal, in this, Aboriginal women in this country have been living in a dystopian society yeah. since colonisation. Yeah. yeah. And also probably the people, other than uh, Louis the Fourteenth and the subsequent ones, un kings under him up to the revolution... <coughs> Uh, everyone, because he had such control and spent all this money here, mm. 
everyone else who is living in their damp, mm. tiny houses without any food. They might have felt quite dystopian with the... I don't know. I think maybe the dystopian narrative... Possibly it relates to modernity, where from the, I think we're still in a modern times, but from the 20s and 30s when those first sort of dystopian novel, novels were being written, there was a really big thing about the future's going to be marvellous mm. and it's going to be clean and we're all going to be healthy and everyone's going to be happy and have houses with light and sunshine. So maybe the, yeah, I don't know, maybe... So it's just a bunch of pessimists doing their best Charlie Booker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. The, yeah. I have one question before we open it up to the floor. There was an AV Club article earlier this year titled have we reached peak dystopia? <laughs> Have we? Who gets to say that? I mean, yeah. people... This is actually the epitomization of the market doing its thing. As long as there's demand... Then an audience for it. An audience, there will be supply. And the, <laughs> the reason we have so many streaming services is because audiences have <coughs> completely diffused <coughs> and have, you know, subtext, subsectors within subsectors. So... I mean, there are mm. dystopias about Earths um, with human survivors. There are dystopias about women being used as cattle. There are dystopias about, what is there, this, this list? Kids fighting each other, battle royale style. I mean, you know, like the, the, the fact that we have all these kind of resources um, and platforms on which to sell these things and people buy them means that it'll probably just keep going. I don't know, like, where do you reach the peak in terms of capitalism in, in the age where everything is dispersed? It's kind of, it's, I don't know, I feel like it's a silly question. There is, there's a question that sort of is, is it peak when people stop watching? Mm. Or is it peak when the quality... Or is it when peak when the quality starts to decline or the same story mm. keeps getting told in the same way? In the same in way. In which case it's a creativity. Yeah, mm. but it's interesting because no one ever asks if we've reached peak procedural drama. <laughs> you know? like, or peak that's, reality and that's, TV. And that's yeah. fine to like recreate and reproduce those yeah. same stories over and over, but because dystopian narratives, I guess, are very... Topical. They're very specific yeah. and also very topical. They're like in response to what's mm. going on in the world that we live in, whereas, you know, Law and Order's been going for, what, like 20 years or something? Yeah. Couldn't tell you the difference between an episode made this year and one made... 20 years ago, except for... The phones, I don't know. Yeah, except for probably the technology. Yeah. Um, so, it's, yeah, it's interesting that, like, the expectations of quality are so much higher on series that, you know, and, and maybe that's fair, like, a series that are trying to do something different, series that are trying to... Like, SVU, Law & Order, and all of its many franchises are not trying to be anything other than what they are. So, I guess you could make that argument that they're like, well, the reason no one says we, why... Ha, when will we reach peak procedural drama is because watching each episode is like watching the same episode mm. of but just told slightly differently and it's it's almost like just eating a hamburger which is the audience appeal for it isn't mm. it the, yeah the, like it's like they know what they're going you know to get to yeah it. exactly it's it's predictable and it's comforting in that way um i do think that there is something in asking though like have we reached peak dystopian fiction because i don't think that it can go on forever I don't think, you know, The Handmaid's Tale can't go on forever. Mm. as long. They'll try and bring it out and it'll go on for four series too long. Um, <coughs> but I think that there is a, a taste for it at the moment mm. for these kinds of stories. And there will always be an audience that is interested in these kinds of stories. But I guess at some point people might start to be interested in, like, solutions that actually relate to the world that we live in as opposed to the possibility of where our world might go. Um, I don't know, maybe not. 
Maybe we'll, maybe this is the start of the dystopia. Maybe we are being brainwashed. The dystopia is us just watching yeah, ever yeah. more dystopian narratives yeah. in a endless so loop. Do you know that what's interesting is I didn't, I never really watched all three of the Matrix movies. That would classify as mm-hmm. a dystopia, totally. wouldn't it? Yeah. But I know the basic premise. I watched some of the first film, and I remember thinking like maybe maybe I've missed the ending or something. Obviously, I've missed the ending. I haven't watched the third film, but maybe I've <laughs> missed the point. But I remember just thinking. Right, so the Earth has, like, gone to total shit and we're plugged into, like, some giant machine living in an alternate reality. What's the problem? <laughs> I, do, I don't really understand why they needed to, like, wake everyone up to what was really going on. Like, to, we're being controlled. It's about it's like, the primacy of the body, which is an ongoing philosophical issue since, since yeah. Plato's time again. Well, I don't know. I we're think obsessed. I'd rather live in the virtual reality. But there's, there's been a string of, you know, I just think there's the first one that comes to mind there's a Bruce Will I think it's called Surrogates a film where it's the same kind of thing is that you're now operating a, a kind of avatar who mm-hmm. navigates yeah. the real world and then it becomes this point of crisis as to whether we want this yeah and the films are operating from the, pres- the uh, premise of course we don't want this because we have primacy over the body yeah. mm. and also we want control over ourselves mm-hmm. uh, and we feel that there's a, a premium placed on reality mm-hmm. in yeah. a very this fixed reality. sense. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think I'd rather the virtual reality though. Um, we can do the whole thing in your pyjamas if it's like surrogates. <laughs> you're just at home on the couch <coughs> and your <coughs> avatar is doing all your business for you. But I mean that kind of raises an interesting point as well is that like when you pose those two things next to each other when you're aware of the primacy of your body, when you're aware of your agency, you're not going to choose to like sacrifice all of that to live in a virtual world. But and if the premise is that you're not that aware of it, mm. I, I, I just personally find that an interesting kind of duality that like, I don't want to give up my agency, but if I'm not aware of it, maybe it's better. <laughs> and we, yeah. it's a sidetrack, but we kind of already have to a certain extent, the extent, for example, that yeah. we've let social media into oh my our God, lives yes. willingly, and it's been sold to us as a leisure activity. Yeah. Had that government been told tell- anyway, that's a side story. <laughs> Louise, did you have a topic uh, for it? No. Let us open to audience questions. Yeah. Can you project, or do you need the mic? He sounds like he has a booming voice. Just for those on the stream, so they can hear. Hi, sorry, I won't shout. Sorry, it's an attempt to diffuse my notes from myself and my wife. Just actually carrying on from your original point. Thank, by the way, thank you very much for this evening. It's been absolutely brilliant. been very interesting from everyone on the panel. Um, my point was initially going back to the point on... Well, actually, it was, it was back to what we talked about before we came tonight, was if you went back to those original people who were writing about the soap, you're like... Aldous Huxley mm-hmm. and George Orwell and talking and, and that what they would see in a modern society, what they would see now as being dystopic. And I wanted to go back to Louise's point about a border around society, such as the the dome in Logan's Run. The wall, sorry. The dome's in the Stephen King thing, fine. No, the dome in Logan's Run. Yeah. And I wanted to look actually linking back to the last point about whether that dome, that that border around society is actually social media and that people are trapped within the way that they look, the way they see each other Mm. and maybe that that in comparison to the 1930s, 1940s people would find that most disturbing the the, the utter introspection, complete looking inside ourselves and not seeing ourselves in the wider society Um, I thought it would be interesting to Possibly leading on to, I, I, I think, I think, I think, social media would, would, is so integral to our idea of whether we are living in a dystopia or not, and how integral social media was to Donald Trump being voted. And then I was halfway rambling through all his thoughts in my head, and I was like, actually, for me, as a modern liberal Brit living in Australia at the moment, looking back at my parent country, for me, Brexit is a dystopia. It is an extraordinary, I, 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 we, we, on, a, on a weekly basis, we'll say, how on earth did we manage to get to this place of Brexit? And I think social media is so interesting because it was used in both the campaigns really integrally. Um, I sw- thought what, what the panel would think from that. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. And I guess, like, 
It's that thing as well of, of realising that nothing... You know, it's, it's sort of the, the argument that people use about Hitler and fascism. And, you know, it's, it's a, a really commonly cited one now that if you say that, you know, you would have stood and risen up against mm. fascism in the 1930s and you would never have... You would personally never have let Hitler have gone that far. Um, well, that, you know, fascism is rising up now and what are you doing? And I think it's that, that thing that, like, people don't realise what's happening until the wall, whether it's physical or metaphorical, until the wall is built. And they won't know whether or not they're on the outside of that wall or whether or not they're being, whether or not they're being kept out of something by that wall or kept in by that wall. Um, and I, th I see Brexit as one of those examples, you know, the same with like our border force, the, the wall in America, mm. all these kind of attempts to sort of create like isolation. And I think that, you know, it happens and it happens incrementally. And then all of a sudden people look up one day and they're like, well, how did this happen? And it's because we're idiots. But and we were watching dystopian TV at the time. <laughs> well, we just don't... I think it's... I think, weirdly, we're like a weird combination of extremely optimistic and extremely ignorant. You know, we don't really... Particularly in the West, particularly when you have, like, all these other layers of privilege too, you just don't ever really think something bad's going to happen to you. It seems you are aware of... It's almost like watching dystopian fiction or being aware of it is like a talisman, you know, that you're aware of what the possibilities are and therefore you think that you'll recognise it when it's happening, but you won't recognise it because yeah. that's the way that fascist dictatorships install themselves, you know. It might appear to you that they've been installed overnight, but all of that stuff has been happening <laughs> behind the scenes for a long time as well. Um, and I guess, like, if I were to kind of, like, look at it, if I were to write a Black Mirror episode, in fact, he did have one on social media mm -hmm. and the way that people engage on social media, that would be where you would start, is, like, distracting people by forcing them to be obsessed with their social capital via, via social media, with the life that they're representing to people, with what everyone else is doing, with... I mean, it's, it's really scary to me, actually, that I was talking to a friend today about, um, I can still remember, as, um, as lots of people in this room, I think, you know, you don't all look too young to like not ha remember a world without Facebook. Mm. But I can still remember having no phone at all. I, like I started university with no phone. And if you needed to meet people for lunch or something, you, there was a, a meeting spot. And I think back on those times, like I knew how to spend time by myself without a phone because I didn't, yeah. We didn't live in that world. You know, I knew how to sit there and think about things, even like things that weren't important or smart, but just, just to kind of like distract myself and entertain myself, read a book and stuff. And now I literally can't walk down the street without pulling my phone out and reading it. I'm not paying attention to anything. And I think if we kind of like lost our phones, if they just stopped working, we'd pa panic initially, but I think we'd actually adapt really, really easily which means that we, we don't need them. Mm -hmm. But w as long as we have them and as long as we live in this kind of social media world, which I fully participate in, I do think that they're a, re a really like effective means of distracting people from, distracting people firstly from what's really going on, but also like making them think that something else is happening. Like I, I th so this is quite dystopian. Did anyone read that article a few months ago about how one of the things that we should be most fearful of in terms of the evolution of technology is the ability to fake videos. Mm. Yeah. So, like, you can impersonate someone and you can... You could make... Someone could make a video of me, like, standing there saying that I'm going to do whatever and people will be like, well, that's... But this, she said it, you know. And this lends credibility. <coughs> when Donald Trump comes out and then <coughs> says, well, actually, it may not have been me yeah. in the Pussygate tape... Yeah. He's already been working towards this moment of that not seeming like yeah. bullshit, but actually seeming like viable yeah. in a world where we're already doubting everything that we, you know, don't believe your lying eyes. And that's what this thing said, that once that te technology is more freely available, yeah. what, how it will succeed in dividing us is that no one will know what to trust. Yeah. And, and that will be completely destabilised, not just in our communities, but also in our own perception of reality. And that is terrifying. That is a terrifying dystopian state of affairs. Yeah. And we're heading towards it.
It's happening. All right. Hello. Thank you for being here, everyone. Um, thank you for having us. I was um, listening to what you were just saying about um, these types of situations coming out of nowhere, and immediately I thought to myself, The Handmaiden's Tale, and how while I was watching it, I was definitely thinking, well, what about Iran in the 70s? And, you know, these types of things do happen, and they have happened throughout human history, and they do always seem to come out of nowhere for humans. But that's not what I'm wanting to talk to you about. <laughs> One of the reasons I loved <coughs> Handmaiden's Tale so much, and even the second season, is because the female characters, apart from potentially the wife, aren't heavily made up. They just look like normal characters. They have close-up shots of regular skin. They, you know, they're not heavily made up with this fresh flowing hair or anything. And I'm a huge fan of the 100 as well. But something that really, really frustrated me, especially in the first episode when they're up in space, is why do they all have this long hair and makeup on? Wouldn't they have shaved heads and no makeup because they have no water? And yeah. you know, it's so unrealistic of the time, any kind of sci-fi space thing. Is that something that any of you think about when you watch this time of? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I definitely, you know, like the fact that. Um, yeah, in the 100... I mean, it's essentially a show marketed to teens and it's on the CW, so it's it's probably in the contracts. But, yeah, like, the perfect hair, the fact that, like... It really annoyed me in The Last Jedi and in The, in the Force Awakens, in the new Star Wars movies, that Rey is, like, running around on Jakku like a little planet urchin and she's wearing a sleeveless top and she's got, like, perfectly bald pits, you know? <laughs> Like, maybe space women don't grow hair. I don't know. It's like, like they can't wear a bra in space because it'll strangle them. It's like them. all those zombie, film, uh, zombie television yeah. shows. I always wonder, how are the women managing their periods? Yeah. What, you know, what's... It, but it's the same as in the, the vampire narratives. No one's ever... Twilight doesn't... Talk, not quite dystopia. No one's talking about this. That's what I'm thinking about. Well, and, and that's kind of what makes you think there were very few women involved in the making of this television yeah. show. One woman in the room would yeah. fix that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, like that that bothers me too. But I and I and I think it's interesting to see that in The Handmaid's Tale, like all of those kind of things explored, because it goes back to what you're saying about the body, you know, and the body's role in dystopian fiction and the and what the body does and produces and yeah. messes things up and yeah, isn't controllable. Oh. I mean, does unpredictable things mm. when it's not controlled. Mm. Yeah. We have time for one more, I think. Uh, All right. Hello. Sorry I was late. Thanks so much for... I'll just note it in the roll. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> issue an apology. <laughs> um, I think that um, with the dystopian texts that I've seen... Um, uh, the way that they present them is in such a way um, so that they will be commercially successful. The way that they do that is to make as broad an audience as possible relate to the most oppressed hero. Um, so in terms of what you were saying earlier about have we reached peak dystopia and and where does dystopia, dystopian text go from here? Um, I think something that I'm kind of looking for is for them, for artists and creators to be making something that um, shows that the majority of the audience is actually not the oppressed hero, is, is actually the kind of privileged oppressor. And, um, well, like, uh, I think many of the people that are watching things like The Handmaid's Tale may have more in common with people like the wife, like Serena the wife, and uh, which, you know, it's controversial because no one really wants to hear that, but it's, it's true. We're possibly, like, we're more likely to be, well, the people in this room, many of us, are likely to be inside the bubble rather than outside it in many ways. Um, what do you think about that in terms of the 
like that perspective on the future of dystopia? I feel like I've talked so much. Uh. I don't. I don't want to be like. Mm. I'll talk more. Um, okay. Adolfo, you haven't said anything for a while. Oh, I haven't. Um, that's okay. Um, it's funny because one of the questions that wasn't touched on is um, who is the victim in mm. dystopian texts? Mm. Um, and when we were talking before about stratified or like kind of walled societies, um, I thought back to, and I did mention it like only in passing, The Time Machine by H.G. Wells, like a classic kind of like dystopia. And it's very um, perfect for these kinds of discussions because it clarifies that kind of debate of perspective. There are only two groups of people um, there and the there's like a human who travels to the future. I don't know if you know the story, um, and finds out that his theory is that humans have kind of diverged into two subspecies. Um, at first, we identify with the Eloi. Um, they live on above ground. They're all like pretty. Oh yeah, that's right. Because uh, Clem, you were talking about like pretty humans who are a bit like mm. stupid or whatever. Um, they're very docile. They're very happy. <coughs> there's no conflict. Um, but they are afraid of the dark. And so the narrator's like, oh, what's going on here? Um, he kind of like susses things out and finds out that there's another subspecies called the Morlocks and they live underground. Um, and so, um, and they kind of like work with machinery and things. So he's like, oh, okay, so humans have, have kind of diverged into this one species of really, really happy, um, like a bit simple, but you know, kind of like graceful superior creatures. And then there are these like subterranean working class people. So I think by that point in the novel, you really identify with the Eloi, just thinking this is gonna be my future, obviously. I'm gonna be like one of the pretty people doing nothing, you know, screw the working class, which is crap, do not be like that. Um, but then as you read the novel, you find out, oh, can I just spoil it? I'm gonna do it. Um, that it turns out the, um, the Morlocks actually feed on the Eloi. And so the situation is actually a kind of like a cattling. So they, they kind of, the Eloi are cows, basically. Like, so they, they live a, a relatively peaceful life and the free Morlocks, range. free range though, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, not that they would know the concept anyway from what I gather from how they're described. Um, yeah, and the Morlocks kind of sustain this society for them to subsist in um, so that they can, they can feed on them. Um, I mean, I don't know where I was going with this, but I guess like the idea is that, you know, Perspective is pivotal to these these narratives, right? And you, you, familiarity is also really strong when you engage with the text. Um, and I think for dystopians, sometimes n n novels um, or films or TV shows, um, the notion of a protagonist, apart unless there's a very clear hero, may be really tricky to discern. So in the time machine, there is no real protagonist. Um, there's just one observer, and there's two groups of people, and it's trying to kind of convey something about how society works based on you know, the interactions between the two people. Um, okay, there was no real point to that. Can in real, in direct, in direct you response can. to you. Um, yeah, great question. Uh, I, one, of th one of the reasons why I really love The 100 is because I feel like in similar mm. ways that you're explaining that you start the show off on the side of the people that have come down from the sky and you're mm. like, yeah, I, these, I look like these people, you know, yeah, they're all great, they can breathe oh no, there's grounders, they're going to kill them. And then you very quickly kind of like realise, oh, I'm the coloniser. Mm. And which of course, as you said, like would be the case. Um, and it's, so it's interesting to kind of like the way that it flips that and forces the viewer to recognise the, com like the complexities and to, and to the side then with the, you know, the people who are already there. But I think just on The Handmaid's Tale, I have wondered to myself what men who watch the show think about mm. it because there are so few options for them to be heroic in it. And I'm not, I definitely don't think that men need to find someone in the story that's heroic in order for them to care about it. But I think a lot of men feel like they, they need to find well. someone in the story who's heroic for them to feel like it matters to them. Mm -hmm. um, ironically, I relate, I enjoy it far less the more heroic June becomes because I, I think it just becomes way less realistic, you mm. know. Uh, for anyone who hasn't seen the second season or the end of it, it, for me, I just felt like it kind of betrayed everything that she was about up, up until that moment. And I also think betrayed human nature. But felt inherently commercial. It felt, yes, it felt very much like it was appealing to the, you know, appealing to the Me Too fallout, yeah. mm. appealing to the idea that, like, <coughs> women need to have really, like, two-dimensional... Uh, superhero characters to represent yeah. us um, and also appealing to the idea well we've got to string out string this out for eight more seasons yeah. you know um, 
and I just think that that makes the show less interesting because she's becoming they're trying to make her like flawed but they're sort of balancing it by making her like this super you know oh this one handmaid's gonna go and back on in the inside and she's gonna tear it all down it's like and self-sacrifice she'd be killed in yeah. you know two two minutes <coughs> on that yeah. note of happiness can I ask you to thank our panellists and thank you all for coming along tonight? <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Lovely. Um, thank you all for coming along tonight and thank you Dr Lauren Rosewan for hosting as well. Um, big clap for you. <laughs> Um, please uh, come back to one of our conversations. We've got some cracking ones coming up. Uh, next week is Screen to Machine, and that's all about the intersections of intimacy, technology, and humans. It's going to be fascinating. Um, and the following week, it's all about comedy being the best medicine for social change and all sorts of juicy things like that. Um, and we have also uh, joining us for that one, Nayuka Gori, activist, and also the Kates from Get Kraken fame to have a chat about that. Thanks again for coming, everyone, and thanks to our panel. <laughs>